Okay, before we head in to this week's market outlook, some updates on the applied level. The communication sector video uh, is done. It will be up Monday. Uh, I'm doing a video on the telecom sector. I've got the screens done and I was going to use the 2022 10Ks for Verizon, uh, AT&T and T-Mobile. However, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday this week, Q4 this week and the 10Ks are usually uh, about two weeks after that the 10Ks are posted. So I'll be using the 2023 10K. So being that I was so close to the 10Ks, well, I'll use 2022 when I can use the 2023s. In the meantime, uh, I was asked uh, quite a bit uh, to do uh, some videos on repos, reserves, and the balance sheet. So I've done uh, three, understanding repos. Uh, it's done, I just have to narrate them. All the screens are done. I'll be using agency uh, to show how they use repos and I'll be uh, giving you some examples from some money market mutual funds and show you how they use repos. Uh, that should be up Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, I think there's about 13 or 14 screens long. Uh, understanding reserves. This one can be a little bit uh, complicated. Uh, that's up next. Screens, I'm about 50% done, uh, but I got to get that up before January 30th because I fly back to Canada on, uh, on the 31st um, and I won't have my, um, uh, the tablet that I write on, I won't have that with me. I have another one back in Canada, but I'm not sure if I can get the same setup, but I, I will try. The understanding Fed balance sheet will come post February 1st. If I can get it done while I'm in Canada, I will. If not, it'll be post February 13th. What, to understand the Fed balance sheet, we have to understand repos, we have to understand reserves and how these things work. And to sort of give you a, uh, a peek ahead, we'll do a little bit about the balance sheet today just to uh, give you an idea of what you can expect. Uh, but uh, that's, that's sort of what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks. Looking at yields for the week that was, money market rates well behaved. In fact, from the one month to the three month, even going out to the four month, you're really not going to get a lot of movement until the Fed actually moves. It's going to be pretty much 100% monetary policy. Once we get out to the capital market curve, uh, the two year starts to build in a lot of anticipation uh, and the curve tends to wag like a dog. Uh, so if we think about the money market rates up here being fairly stable, uh, there is the dog. We'll draw some legs for the dog and a, uh, a couple ears and a smile. And there's the tail and the tail will wag up or down depending on how uh, how the interpretation of the pace of rate cuts is, uh, is taken by the market. But Bostick this week poured some, uh, poured some cold water on the idea of six to seven rate cuts saying we he doesn't see rate cuts until the third quarter. Uh, so the market said, okay, well, we'll take one rate cut back. How's that sound? Curve inversion uh, from the 2 to the 10, a little bit more inverted on the capital market curves, which is up here, the 210, 510, 210, 1030. The money market to capital market um, became less inverted because you have uh, this end of the curve rising, and these uh, rates, especially the three month, is fairly, fairly stable. So you'll get uh, some uninversion happening here, but the capital market curve. 557 days now, 444 uh, for the money market, the capital market. One thing that is hard to escape is the uh, depth and the duration, D times D. The depth, meaning how deep the inversion got, the uh, 2 to the 10 year got to almost 100. The three month to the 10 year, uh, 200. That's, uh, those are deep inversions and the duration for this long never, ever uh, has there not been a recession preceding that uh, or um, uh, not preceding but uh, following that. Never has there not been a recession. It's hard to escape that. Same with leading indicators. We get that on Monday uh, and it has been negative for quite some time and never uh, have we escaped a recession when it has been that negative for that long? It's it's hard to just brush those aside and ignore those. So, just to let you know that those uh, those big indicators have a 100% track record. 
And I know that a lot of economists have pulled back their probability of a recession this year. It's just hard to ignore those two things. Canada, negative 60 basis points and negative 154 on the three month to 10 year. The balance sheet continues to run off another 25.6 billion. We're getting close to the six handle, 7.046 trillion versus 7.072. The Fed balance sheet is down by 13 billion. But 26 billion almost was runoff, which means the rest of the balance sheet must have gone up by 12.6 billion. We'll take a look at the balance sheet uh, in this video, and we'll look at both assets and liabilities. I have been asked, why do I only pay attention to assets? Why not the liabilities? Assets equal liabilities uh, for the Fed balance sheet. There is no equity. Assets equal liabilities. So if we know the level of assets, we automatically know the level of liabilities. Money market funds, yeah, look at that, decreased by $14 billion. not for retail, though, retail up 1.65, uh, 1.14 in government, 3.86 in prime, you may say, but that's way more than 1.6. I don't include the tax exempt, tax exempt uh, decreased a lot. For institutions, a big drop, $15.77 billion, government uh, down 16.81, prime up one3 Next FOMC is 10 days away. They do creep up fast, don't they? Like a large family and birthdays. Uh, Bank of Canada, three days away. I don't expect any move there, and no one's expecting any move from the FOMC. 97.4% on uh, no move up from 94.8. I think the real number is 100%. 2.6 on the, on the cut. U.S. GDP, we get our first look at fourth quarter. U.S. GDP in four days. The forecast is for 2%. Coming off a wickedly hot Q3, um, the FOMC committee members think, eh, pretty much all of them think, that growth is going to be benign over 2024, 1% to 2% range. Let's see what Q4 looks like. We get that on Thursday. Followed on Friday by PCE. <clears throat> there is a high correlation between CPI and PCE. PCE comes in lower, but it usually moves in lockstep with CPI. CPI came in a little hotter. I expect PCE to do the same thing, but I think it's just more of the same information. It's not different information, just more of the same information. Uh, in capital markets, for issuance, nothing really exciting. A two-year, a five-year, and a seven-year note, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Going out to June, big changes here. This is last week in this column over here. And uh, uh, the probability of three rate cuts by June, by June, three was 53.5. That's dropped to 28.5. Having less than three rate cuts by June, one or two rate cuts was only 11.5%. Uh, it is now 68% that there'll be only one or two. Uh, three has dropped to 28.5. Having more than three rate cuts last week, 35% probability that by June, there'd be more than three. That is almost non-existent now. It seems like we are on the base case. And this is just by June. The Fed has said by the end of the year, the market is saying, no, no, it'll be by mid-year, with 68% saying, nope, no, no, which I think is probably where the Fed would like to see uh, those expectations. Effective federal funds rate still sitting at 5.33. Still some lag in the system if we think 12 months, 100 basis points still to take effect at some point. Reverse repo up 22, uh, up 22 million. Uh, we saw the Fed balance sheet on net up 12. Uh, the reverse repo is a liability. So if assets are up by 12, liabilities have to be up by the same amount. We can see the reverse repo is made up 22 of that. Uh, we'll see if we can find uh, where the rest of it is. The reverse repo did hit a new low on January 16th of $583 billion. And uh, what I'll try to do when we show the balance sheet is explain if this hits zero, I will then explain to you what would happen to liabilities. Um, so this week we're going to look at the Fed balance sheet. We'll look at assets uh, and liabilities on the uh, balance sheet. Real rates all backing up, 16 points on the five-year We'll look at the uh, text of Bostick's speech, and in the text there were three slides. He had a slide presentation behind him. We'll look at the three slides. 
uh, and he has a, um, a graph of the real rate, the overnight real rate, uh, showing that it has been the highest since like 2007. Uh, but still upward sloping on the real rate curve, inflation expectations all uh, up over the week as well. The uh, Fed funds futures um, basically at 125 basis points now, so firmly five cuts. Last week it was six and a third cuts, so uh, uh, it was I think a 158, uh, so 33 basis points have come out. We have uh, 46 from the end of January to the end of June, uh, basically looking at two rate cuts uh, by the end of June. Uh, another 40 basis points uh, in the second quarter, or sorry, the third quarter, which is the end of June to the end of September, and there's where Bostic says they are, that they were thinking that they were starting in the third quarter. So this really should be zero. He's in Bostic is thinking it should look like this, and then uh, you would start to increase it. So there's one to two rate cuts. That's about one and a half rate cuts. You got another 38 here. I say that's about one to two. It comes to five rate cuts. Fed's at three, market's at five. It was at six to seven, it's at five. Yeah, they're getting closer together. I think it's the right move, which means if I'm looking at TLT, TLT had a bad week, down 2.52, but let's remember, it had a great run. It got down to $84 and then basically over a two month period ran and threatened $100. It peaked its head over $100 a couple of times. That's a big run for a Fed that says we're not cutting yet. We're just determining how long to keep rates flat. So I had to sell the $100 calls at that point. Um, I exited early because there was good money in it. I should have just waited. Uh, well, you know. I still made money on it, uh, but I am still long TLT to some degree, so I am down on that, but not as much as I would have been had I not sold the calls. I don't know that I want to sell calls again. Uh, however, being that the market is at five, the Fed is at three, I feel fairly comfortable continuing to sell puts on TLT, so I would be looking at, where are we now, 94.15, the 94, the 93, the 92 dollar uh, level, I'd probably be comfortable selling there. Uh, SPY up 1.17 this week, and we will see that we are at an all-time high. Cue the band. Uh, PC on Friday, uh, the Fed in 10 days. This is the risk that we have on TLT right now. We have a GDP and PCE. I don't know that there's a lot of incremental information we're going to get out of that stuff. Uh, the big, the next big move is the Fed and the press conference. IVP backing up, but just a little. And we can see Bostick's effect right here. We had dropped to just below the $95 uh, mark. And then, of course, the Bostick uh, sell-off down to into the 93s. Saying so cuts to begin in Q3, which is post the June. Uh, um, it's uh, when he says Q3. Here's the June uh, uh, and end of quarter. So there is uh, Q1, uh, Q2 in here. Here's September. Here's Q3. So he's saying somewhere in here uh, he expects uh, to start cutting rates. So we will, uh, let's have a look at Bostick's uh, uh, charts because he, he presented uh, three rather interesting charts. Okay, this is up at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Atlanta is a voting member this year. January 18th, we have our key points. Now let's just look at the data. This is the real federal funds rate. So it's the overnight rate uh, less the current read on inflation. Uh, and you got to go all the way back to 2000, 2007 uh, to get real rates as high as they are. And his conclusion from this slide is that we are sufficiently restrictive at this point. Uh, so he is sort of on board with uh, the thinking is there are no more rate rate hikes. That, that's it for the rate hikes. We are sufficiently restrictive. And he does say in here, the only question is how long do we stay at this level before we start cutting? So we're in phase two, which is the hold. The question is when does phase three begin? He sort of showed his hand a bit saying Q3. Uh, his next slide here, personal consumption expenditure, PCE. I'm not quite sure why uh, he's got the dotted line here below the one as his 2% objective. I tried to make sense of it, but I couldn't. So I'm just going to ignore it because here's the 2% two, 2 line. 
have a look at what we have. If you look at three month uh, percent change, uh, it's already it's already there, uh, well under two percent. If we look at the six month percent change, it's already at two percent, and the twelve month percent change is uh, two point six percent. Uh, he mentions it up here. Uh, I think it was down here that he mentions it. Uh, yeah, two point six. With the the last uh, print has PC inflation at two point six uh, percent for the twelve months through November, and we will get uh, with January's reading this Friday. Uh, we will get uh, December's PCE, but uh, on the three month and the six month job done. It's just the twelve month uh, at this point. But you know nothing ever moves in a linear fashion. You always get this kind of thing, but. It's a step down function. I think we can clearly see we have a step down function that has momentum behind it. I think it continues. And the last one is interesting. If we were thinking about, well, what is the uh, what is the level of jobs you have to add every year just to stand still? So he has it on here, just a, a little under a hundred thousand. Break even unemployment level needed to keep unemployment rate stable. And uh, this is going back to August of 2022 and we can see it coming down again nothing ever comes straight down it's a step function right you have this step function going on uh, but this is the line to watch just looks like about 80,000 80 85,000 80, that if we see job creation hit hit 85 or drop below 85 85 would be saying that the economy is actually uh, losing jobs at that point because you need that many jobs just to keep up with population growth. So if you don't have that kind of job creation, if you have less than that job creation, you have more people that are entering, that are becoming of working age with no job available for them. So the unemployment rate would naturally increase, even though you'd say, well, how can it happen? We're adding 50,000 jobs a month. And that's not enough jobs to keep up with the population growth of what you need to add each month. So at least we have a number uh, that we can look at. The rest of the text is uh, basically, you know, the bullet points. If you want the bullet points, they're, they're right at the very top. Um, Atlanta Fed, Rafael Bostic discusses latest thoughts. Um, says the FOMC may be approaching a new phase in the mon monetary policy cycle that began in March 2022. Monetary policy is sufficiently restrictive to promote the return of inflation of the community's 2% target uh, over the medium term. Uh, community's primary challenge now shifts to assessing how long the federal funds target range should be held at its current level before it will be appropriate to begin unwinding the restrictive stance of policy. Uh, explains that faster than expected progress on inflation strong economic growth and a healthy labor market signal it may soon be time to reassess the monetary policy stance that's that's hopeful isn't it faster than expected progress on inflation uh, sums up his current policy views with two words grateful and vigilant grateful for the progress on inflation but he's staying vigilant because though inflation has been moving towards two percent for some time numerous risks could throw it off course affirms that his views will be informed by the incoming data, blah, blah, blah. We don't have to read that one. That's a, sort of a standard safe harbor statement they make. I'll be, you know, I'm data dependent and I'm willing to change my mind. Mortgage rates dropped again this week, which is interesting, down six basis points while the 10-year over the same period, Thursday over Thursday, rose 16 basis points. So the spread contracted 22, 246 basis points down from... I think we were over 300 at one point, 308. So one-sixth uh, of the spread is now gone. Uh, didn't help any of the mortgage REITs this week. Higher rates uh, are going to affect them. DHI, we have earnings this week on DHI. Housing kind of mixed, taking a bit of a breather. Uh, not too much excitement in the REITs or the ETFs that track the housing sector. But uh, we are moving in the right direction on uh, mortgage rates. Uh, OAS, nothing exciting to see here. Just uh, still uh, no fear in, uh, in credit spreads. Mortgage apps for January 12th, up 10.4%. That's a big jump. The housing market index ended at 44. It was 39, the last read was 39. It is now moving upwards, 44. Building permits up 1.9, housing starts down 4.3, existing home sales down one percent this is for december on wednesday we'll get new home sales and pending home sales on thursday okay let's have a look at the balance sheet you're going to find four columns 
up here is average of daily figures so for the week ending these are averages based on daily balances this is as of the date Wednesday January 17th which is the column uh, we're going to look at this gives you the change over the week uh, the average change over the week and this column gives you the average change over the year this is for 2023 this is for January 10th and this is January 17th it's the last column if we're looking for a balance sheet is as of the date of and as of the date of Wednesday 7 January 17th this is what we had couple of uh, line items are the big important ones in here. There's a lot of line items, but the really important ones here, securities held outright, and it gives you a list of the uh, securities that are uh, held outright. Uh, bills are important, 213. Uh, we'll mention those uh, at another point, 213. Keep that in mind. Securities, uh, seven, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the average, 213, 7.158 uh, trillion. This is the SOMA, which we know is approaching 7 trillion, plus extra securities uh, that the Fed holds on its balance sheet. Uh, SOMA, you can consider permanent. Other assets, other securities uh, uh, are temporary. So it does engage in some temporary open market operations. Uh, it will use repos for that, and it will use some securities on a temporary basis. Uh, and the SOMA was meant to be permanent, meaning that when they buy securities uh, for permanent open market operations, there is no plan to sell them in 30 days or 60 days. It's we'll sell them when we change our mind. Uh, repos, here's your repurchase agreements. Repos uh, are assets, reverse repos are liabilities, because repos, you're lending money. If you're lending money, a loan is an asset because it's owed to you. Uh, for a reverse repo, you're borrowing money. That's why it's liability. We can see repos here at zero. The Fed is not that active in the repo market. In the reverse repo, it is because it helps with monetary policy. But in a well-functioning repo market, there really is no need to step in. Uh, and if there is a need to adjust the level of reserves on a temporary basis, they would do it with repos. If there is a need to adjust reserves on a permanent basis, they would do it with securities held. Uh, the bank term funding program. Uh, is another asset. These are loans uh, given to uh, given to banks uh, under uh, the um, special program they started last year uh, with the failures of a couple of big banks. Uh, on December 6th, it was 121.7 billion. It is now 161.5 billion, an increase of almost 40 billion over six weeks, uh, and it expires, I think, in nine weeks, ten weeks. Uh, the question is, given the you know 161 billion in there, uh, are banks going to be expected to return that before the end of the period, and this goes away, uh, or does it get extended? Um, so that's something something we'll look at. But it's it's not unrealistic. It's not it's not you know like 500, 600, 700 billion, but it is creeping up. So week to week, we uh, should probably as the uh, due date or the end date draws near, we should probably keep our eye uh, on that one. Average balance up, uh, the average balance per day up almost, uh, almost 10 billion, 9.3 uh, billion. So there is the total uh, amount of assets uh, that the Fed has. Now it's called total factors supplying reserve funds. Um, when we look at liabilities, we count up some other liabilities first. And then whatever's left over are reserves. So we do have the level of reserves. We do have the level of reverse repo. Uh, we do have the currency in circulation. We do have the TGA uh, on liability. So let's have a look at that. Okay, a couple of uh, line items here are the important ones. There's a bunch of line items, but some are really important. Currency in circulation, this tends to only go up. It goes up about 6% a year. It's a liability of the Federal Reserve, and it tends to just move in one direction, which is up. That's the currency. That's not the money supply now. That's a currency in circulation. As the economy gets bigger, the amount of currency in circulation tends to grow. As the demand for U.S. dollars abroad increases as more countries uh, sort of adopt the de facto dollar system, the more there is currency in circulation. And if you increase currency in circulation, you're increasing liabilities, you have to increase assets because assets equal liabilities. So you have to find a way to increase the assets. And we saw what the assets are composed of on the previous screen. So one of those accounts would have to go up. We have re 
reverse repurchase agreements because this is the Fed uh, borrowing money, 949. You have foreign official and international accounts and you have others, which is the one that we, uh, that we have been watching. Uh, 590 uh, over here. Uh, and this has been going down. It was over 2 trillion, 2.5 trillion, and it has been coming down. Now, if liabilities are coming down, that means assets must be coming down. What was the big asset that was coming down uh, over that period of time? It was the SOMA. Now, if assets are not coming down and we see reverse repo coming down, that means another liability must be going up because it has to balance. If a liability drops and no assets are involved, uh, another liability has to increase. Part of the big increase in uh, decrease in the reverse repo was the big increase since the middle of the summer in the U.S. Treasury General account. Yellen is targeting around 750 uh, billion. There was 748 sitting at 773. The big increase in the TGA is done. So if we're looking for uh, reverse repos uh, to continue to drop. Uh, I don't know that we can expect liabilities to increase to pick up the slack. If these drop, assets drop. In a, or saying in another way, as the assets run off the balance sheet, it will hit the reverse repo until the reverse repo is zero. And as the assets continue to drop, then something else has to drop. Here's the thing. Uh, currency in circulation uh, is not going to drop. We're assuming that we have zero over here. The TGA... Uh, Yellen wants to keep it around 750 billion. That's probably not going to drop. Reserves have to drop. Uh, and to see how that is done, I want you to understand that every dollar out there that is not in circulation, every dollar out there is in the banking system. Uh, you may not think it is, but it's in the banking system. You get your paycheck, your bank account goes up. You spend some money, uh, the bank account of the place you spend money at goes up. They pay their employees, well, their employees' bank accounts go up. It's all in the banking system. You go to the store, you swipe your debit card, the money comes out of your account, it goes into another account. So the reserves, the uh, uh, level of reserves for any one particular bank can fluctuate. However, for the system as a whole, it stays in the system. So if the Fed is rolling off, let's say, $10 billion dollars, and we'll say it's in 30-year bonds, just to give you an idea of how this works. It's in 30-year bonds. The Treasury has to redeem it. So let's say the Treasury doesn't issue any bonds to redeem that $10 billion. Assets, securities held, will drop by $10 billion, and the TGA will drop by $10 billion. But that's usually not how it works. Usually new bonds are sold to redeem the existing bonds coming in. So the TGA would drop by $10 billion, to pay back uh, the 10 billion that are maturing, but then would rise by 10 billion with the issuance of new bonds. So the TGA would be zero. Assets are down 10. That 10 has got to come from somewhere. It's either going to come from the reverse repo or it's going to come from reserves. Now you might say they're 30 year bonds. <laughs> that, those are not, uh, you know, the reverse repo is money market funds. Through the repo mechanism, you can turn a 30 year bond into a money market security because something called a general collateral uh, uh, repo means that anything can be collateral. Uh, that's the beautiful thing about the, the, the repo market is if there are not enough money market securities, you can always create money market securities by repoing a long-term bond. But let's say the repo level is zero, so it can't come from the repo. It's not going to come from currency and circulation. It's not going to come from the Treasury general account. It's going to come from reserves. So as once this hits zero, as the Fed keeps running down its balance sheet, reserves are going to start running down. It has to because all the money is in the banking system, which means somebody somewhere has to be owning those $10 billion worth of bonds. If they're owning those $10 billion worth, billion worth of bonds, then the level of reserves in the system must drop. It must drop because... Uh, if all the money is in the banking system and you pull $10 billion out of the banking system, it has to come from reserves. That's the problem with the reverse repo hitting zero and the Fed continuing to run off its balance sheet. Then it will start hitting, uh, it will start hitting the reserves. At the tune of, what are they running off? $95 billion a month? So the question is, how far down do they want to let this go before they say enough is enough? Last time they let it go down, it got to 1.5 trillion, and we had a problem in the money markets in September of 2019. A big problem. The Fed had to step in uh, very quickly. Uh, SOFR rates spiked like 500 basis points. 
Uh, so they are saying, we don't want to get to that level. We want to be somewhere above that level, but not too much above that level, but somewhere above that level. You're at 3.5. So when this gets to zero, we'll see what this number is. That'll give you some idea of the pace of the runoff. And if we think, well, a trillion dollars a year is the runoff, uh, will they let it get down to 2.5, right? Or will they start discussing sometime this summer about slowing down the pace of, of runoff? Because they do want to stay in an ample reserves regime. And this is ample reserves. So I'm not going to explain what ample reserves are here. But that gives you an idea of what would happen uh, if balance sheet runoff continues on the asset side. The liabilities have to come down. And there's really only four big accounts. There's currency and circulation. There's reverse repo. There's the treasury general account. And there are reserves. Don't look to currency and circulation coming down. Once this hits zero, if this is sitting where Yellen wants it to be at 750, it must come from reserves. Okay, let's look at S&P all time high, and not just by a little. Look at uh, look at those two big green bars on the far end of the chart. 482.64. The last all time high was 477.60. We are one. 0.06% above the all-time high and decisively. So from a technical perspective, because we are so decisively, since it was such a decisive breakout, uh, if, if uh, the S&P does uh, fall back and retest the 477.60 and bounce off there and head up, that is a very strong signal for a leg higher uh, on the index altogether from a technical perspective, mind you. Forward four quarter operating earnings, uh, IBES 242.92 down from 243.52. Not much, but still in the wrong direction, right? And uh, for SP Global 240.68 down from 241.24. Again, not much, but still in the wrong direction and price higher. So a combination of price higher, operating earnings lower, you have a multiple of 20 times the forward earnings versus 19.74. Implied volatility, 13 week implied volatility at 40%. So there's still some premium uh, in there. I just don't know what I would be doing at this point. I, 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 I never had this level of indecision where it could go either way and I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, so I certainly wouldn't sell calls, and I certainly wouldn't sell puts. So the implied volatility to me is meaningless because I just I just wouldn't play uh, at this index level. I would find individual securities uh, that I would say, okay, I'm comfortable selling uh, some puts on these individual securities. But at the level of the index, hmm, I really don't know what to, what to do there. Uh, for companies that are reporting this week. I think over 60 companies are reporting. We'll look at sectorspider.com. Um, I've looked at the S&P, uh, SP Global's spreadsheet, and I looked at uh, uh, the uh, this week in earnings. Um, they're both off. Uh, they both have different numbers, and and, and some of them, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, this week in earnings doesn't even have Tesla reporting on Wednesday. That's kind of a big one to miss. And SMB Global is saying that there are some 30 some company or 26 companies reporting this week, and it's like 68 or 70 companies that are reporting. They're both wrong. So I went to Sector Spider because, well, they control all of the, uh, they, they run all the ETFs for all of the sectors, which represent all of the SP companies. They, they must know. They got to know, right? So uh, they have a really, really sleek interface. So we'll have a look at that, and this will be uh, the new favored one to look at for earnings because uh, these guys, these guys, they're slipping. So if you guys out there are listening, come on. So some notable earnings. Uh, Tuesday, DR, uh, DR Horton, uh, Netflix, General Electric. We have Verizon. You can see Wednesday we have uh, AT&T, and Thursday we have T-Mobile, which is on fire. All-time highs. Dead money dead money and what is going on with T-Mobile all-time highs outperformed on a 10-year basis out significantly outperformed the S&P 500 uh, by a country mile uh, whereas you have dead money uh, in the big networks 
over here. Wednesday, Freeport, uh, AT&T, uh, IBM, LAM Research. Let's see how the uh, semiconductor sector is doing. I think you have Intel uh, somewhere in here as well. Uh, and now, ServiceNow, which is uh, sort of an AI stalker. It's been riding the AI, uh, the AI bandwagon. Uh, next era energy uh, in the utility sector uh, Union Pacific uh, Friday American Express let's have a look at sector uh, sector spider uh, as far as the economic data next week the big one the big ones GDP followed by PCE Monday we get uh, leading indicators but they've been negative for so long that I don't think anybody even cares anymore it's just one more negative reading in a line of negative readings that nobody cares. But again, never has the economy escaped a recession uh, when the leading when the leading index, it's not one indicator, it's the leading index or an index of leading indicators has been that negative that long. And same with the, the yield curve, both the capital market yield curve and the money market, the capital market yield curve. Yet here we are with earnings. Right, still, uh, even even though they're coming down, they're not dropping. They're coming down a little, not in the right direction, but I'm, it's nothing to be alarmed about. Those are big earnings. Those are record record earnings, still with almost record margins. Some of you may uh, point out that, well, you know, we've seen a lot of layoffs happen uh, so far this year. It seems every company that's reporting earnings is also announcing a series of layoffs. That is true but they are lower uh, than they were in 2023 by this time. It is quite common in January uh, at the end of the fourth quarter uh, when you're giving guidance for the year to have layoffs. It's, it's quite common to have that in January. That's usually a month where you know, the announcements are made of you know, the headcount reduction over the course of the year. That's part of guidance, right? Uh, but they are lower than last year, but you still can't help but notice that every company reporting seems to uh, be pointing to layoffs that the margins that they're holding may be high for a certain period of time because of cost, uh, cost effectiveness, and that AI really hasn't shown up yet. However, I will say this. I have been learning Spanish with Duolingo. Uh, uh, not the best, by the way. If you want to increase your vocabulary dramatically, Duolingo. If you want to understand the rules of grammar, uh, <laughs> they just don't give it to you. So you're left memorizing everything. You know, why does this word go in front of that word? So anyways, that's my little rant about Duolingo. Make sure you have a grammar book. But I've been paying attention now that I use Duolingo. I see it in the headlines. It laid off some staff as well. It, lay, it wasn't staff, it was contract staff. They laid off a whole bunch of contract staff saying we don't need you anymore because the generative AI model we're using is, is just as good, if not better, than you guys. So we're already starting to see some generative AI start to show up over here. Now, I noticed that on Duolingo, if I go into practice mode and I practice previous levels, and then I go into, there's another module where it's just listening, and then you have to type out what you heard so that you get used, your ear gets used to hearing the language. When I go into practice mode for a period of time, and then I go into the listening mode, the, the uh, sentences I'm getting are much easier than if I don't go into practice mode because the system thinks, oh, you, don't, you, you didn't need practice, so you must, be, you must be way up here. But you spent three hours in practice, so maybe you need to have simpler sentences for a period of time. So that is kind of nice. I kind of like that it does that. It, it, when I go into, into the listening mode, it doesn't pick, off where, pick up at the difficulty where I left off. It picks up on the idea that, hey, you needed three hours of practice at the previous modules, so here you go. So that's kind of nice. So maybe the generative AI over the course of the year will actually start to show up more. Uh, so let's listen to the uh, company reports, uh, the conference calls, or as many as we're interested in listening to, and let's see what they're saying about where AI is. And I think ServiceNow will be uh, one you'll want to listen to. LAM Research and Intel will be interesting for the state of the semiconductor industry. Let's see what Freeport has to say about uh, copper and DHI. What's the guidance on housing? Uh, Netflix, uh, here we're going to be looking at how many subscribers did you add, the net ads, and how is that, how's that advertising thing going, and what are your plans uh, over 2024 for price increases? 
if they're offering guidance, this is pretty much where they start to telegraph. There might be some possibility there. Let's go look at Sector Spider. Okay, so the website is sectorspdrs.com, sectorspider.com, and uh, you have your earnings calendar January 21st to the 27th. It tells you, there's Monday, Tuesday, you just click on each day, it tells you how many companies are reporting on each day if we want to go back uh, to the week before. Uh, we can see Monday was 0, 3, 6, 6, and 7. We can see which ones reported on those days, but here we are, January 22nd, only one. Uh, it tells you the sector, XLF. It gives you the weighting of it so we can judge how important it would be. Uh, heavier weighting means it could affect that sector uh, a lot more, or it could have an effect on the S&P, but at 0.12, I don't expect it's going to affect uh, the XLF very much. Consensus EPS, $0.88. Cents. Go to Tuesday. You have 18 of them. We can see what sectors uh, that they're in. We can see the weights. Look at this one. Procter & Gamble, XLP, 14%. So we know right away Procter & Gamble is going to be a risk event for the XLP. So if we're long XLP, we can't ignore Procter & Gamble on this one. Consensus EPS, 170 uh, Johnson & Johnson, XLV, 7.53. Not very heavy, but it's still there and uh, the weightings drop down so it's 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 kind of nice that it gives you the big ones that you want to pay attention to the ones with the most weight and then further down you go like Invesco in the XLF Synchrony in the XLF they, they can't possibly uh, possibly move the dial they're just too small uh, who have we got here Netflix uh, is reporting. There's Verizon. Next day is AT&T. Next day is T-Mobile. There you have General Electric. Uh, Halliburton, Baker Hughes for uh, XLE. These are in the uh, services. The uh, I think they're in the OIH, the oil services companies. Uh, 3M, ADM. Texas Instrument will be interesting uh, as far as analog chips. Texas Instrument is huge in analog chips. Not a big weighting, uh, 1.65 in the XLK, but they'll be interesting. There's DR Horton uh, in consumer discretionary, small weighting, uh, expected 2.87. Wednesday, who is the most important one here? Uh, again, in order of weight, Tesla, XLY, consumer discretionary. <clears throat> There's a big risk day, 15.61. Consensus estimate, 73 cents. The whisper is 60 cents. Uh, so the whisper being at 60 cents is sort of suggesting that they're going to miss their 73 cents. And with a weighting of 15.61 uh, in the XLY, that is a big risk event. Freeport in the XLB, 6% weight. Uh, consensus EPS, 24 cents. Uh, there's AT&T. Uh, small weighting. All the, uh, the, the three telecoms in the XLC, all are about 4%. They only make up about... 12% of the sector and they used to be the original sector were those three and uh, now there's 22 of them in the XLC and they still <laughs> only 13% uh, percent. 56 cents the big thing for AT&T is going to be progress on its network and the level of debt it's trying to get its debt down to a certain level if you look at AT&T and Verizon massive amounts of debt massive amounts of debt IBM will be interesting uh, service now uh, will be interesting. There's LAM Research uh, as well. If you're into uh, casinos, there's Las Vegas Sands. Small weighting. Uh, the further down you go, the less important uh, they happen to be. Let's have a look at Thursday. Who's the big one? Next Era. As far as utilities goes, it's one of the bigger ones. 13% consensus estimate, 50 cents. It it has the potential to move that that sector. Then you have Visa. 8.25 Sherwin Williams. Sherwin Williams is interesting uh, because paint, there's something called the white paint index that you can judge the state of the economy by the amount of white paint sold because it is the most common paint. Whenever you construct something or build something, you paint the walls white. So using that white paint index, if white if sales of white paint are going up, and that means that investment uh, in structures and uh, whether it be residential, non-residential structures are going up. Sherwin Williams will be important. There's T-Mobile on fire, just absolutely on fire. XLC, you got to have a look. But put up Spy and T-Mobile on a 10-year chart and just look at T-Mobile. You're going to want to figure out what the hell it's doing. Uh, it is an interesting company. Uh, Union Pacific, 
<clears throat> uh, what else do we have in here that's interesting? Intel will be interesting. <clears throat> See what kind of progress they've made on their foundry model because they were captive. They have their own foundries. But now they're starting to produce chips for other customers as well. So we'll see how they're, uh, what progress they've made on that. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Southwest Airlines, uh, NVR, which is another housing stock uh, in XLY. And Friday, we only have two. CAT, uh, which is a, uh, a big one. Uh, and uh, a railroad, Norfolk Southern. And that's it for this week.